Hi, and welcome to Jules Voto's Photo Focus. In this video, we're going to be going over the features, controls, and how to use the Yashica 12, a medium format twin lens reflex camera. But before we get into the camera itself, I just want to talk a little bit about the twin lens reflex. They were very popular in the 50s, 60s, I guess into the 70s as well. Wedding photographers uh, use them quite a bit, portrait photographers. Now the twin lens reflex dates back to 1929 when the first Roloflex was introduced. And Roloflex is the most famous of the twin lens reflex cameras, but other companies made them, including Mamaya, Yashica, Minolta, and others. So let's just go over what a twin lens reflex is, and I'm going to give you the advantages and disadvantages compared to a single lens reflex camera. So what is a twin lens reflex camera? Well, by the name, you can tell that it has two lenses. There is a taking lens on the bottom, the lens that is used to take the picture. And above that is a viewing lens. And when you look through the, the, onto the ground glass screen of a twin lens reflex, some of the cameras will actually, uh, you could actually put a prism on it. So you're looking at an eye level prism. But what you are looking through is not the taking lens like you would with a 35 millimeter or a medium format single lens reflex camera you are looking through the viewing lens. Okay, so the two lenses then is the main thing that differentiates a TLR from an SLR. So now let's look at the advantages of the twin lens reflex. Because you're looking through the viewing lens, there's no blackout when you take a picture. When using a 35 millimeter single lens reflex or a medium format, the mirror flips up to expose the film, and for a split second, you lose the view. Not so with the twin lens reflex. Also, because it has a leaf shutter, the shutter on this camera is in the lens. It's very quiet. Since there's no flipping mirror like on a single lens reflex, there's no vibration when you release the shutter. Also, a leaf shutter enables you to synchronize with flash up to its maximum shutter speed. Now, a, a, a leaf shutter, usually the top shutter speed is 1 500th of a second. So if you're doing outdoor fill flash photography, you can shoot at a 500th of a second, which is a nice advantage. That's one of the reasons why wedding photographers like cameras with leaf shutters. You have a large focus screen for composition. You're not looking through a small viewfinder, although some of these cameras do take prisms, not the Yashica here, but you have a large viewing surface. Okay, you can look down, you could hold it at waist level and compose your image. There's no need to turn the camera for verticals. Because you're producing a square image, you crop later. You could crop it either vertical or horizontal when it's time to make a print. Also, you can use a strong filter. If you have ever used a red filter over your lens when taking black and white pictures to bring out the clouds, well, you can use that on this camera, but it's not gonna darken your view. And you know on a single lens reflex, when you put that red filter over your lens, that the view through the viewfinder gets dark. Not so with the twin lens reflex camera. Probably the biggest advantage of the medium format twin lens reflex over a 35 millimeter camera is the size of the negative or transparency it produces. The negative is two and a quarter inches square or six by six centimeters. That compares to a 35 millimeter negative, which is approximately one inch by one and a half inches. So if we want to make an eight by 10 from a two and a quarter square negative, we have to enlarge it approximately five times, actually a little bit less than that. If we want to make an eight by 10 from a 35 millimeter negative, we have to enlarge it eight times. 
So less enlargement means more apparent sharpness and also less grain. Now, you do have to crop, as I, as I stated. The negative is square. If you wanted to print the entire negative, enlarged it five times, you would produce a 10 by 10. With the 35 millimeter, if you enlarged it eight times uh, without cropping, you would produce an eight by 12. One of the reasons wedding photographers like square format cameras, or at least they did <laughs> when shooting film, was you could mount the flash high up over the camera and not have to worry about shadows to either side of the subject. And of course, if you use a 35 millimeter camera shooting weddings with a flash mounted above the camera, when you turn the camera for a vertical, well, you needed a bracket that would flip the flash to stay over the lens. None of that with the TLR. Now there are disadvantages. Most twin lens reflex cameras do not have interchangeable lenses. The Yashica doesn't, the Minolta doesn't, the Roloflex doesn't, although Roloflex did produce one with a 135 millimeter lens for portraits, but that was a fixed lens. It wasn't interchangeable. Um, so you're stuck with the lens that came with the camera, usually an 80 or a 75 millimeter lens. There's also the problem of parallax. With a 35 millimeter single lens reflex, or any single lens reflex for that matter, you're viewing right through the lens, as I said before. With this, you are viewing through the upper viewing lens, which means this lens is seeing a little bit different view than the lower lens. It really doesn't matter at distance. As you get closer, that problem becomes bigger. Now, some twin lens reflex cameras, as you focus closer, there's either a mask that comes down that covers up the top part of the focus screen or a needle that will appear and you need to keep your subject matter below that. With this camera, there isn't. So you just have to be aware that as you get closer, just leave a little extra room above since it's not seeing the same thing. Now, Mamaya made something which was called a paramender. You attached it to your tripod and put the camera on top you focused, you got your image all framed, and then you just turn the lever and it brought the camera up to compensate for that distance from the taking lens to the viewing lens. So these cameras are not great for that reason for close-up photography. Although the Mamaya did have a built-in bellows and it had that parallax correction, so they were more suited to it. Although you could fit close-up lenses onto these cameras again it's not the best solution. Another thing with the waist level finder, your view is reversed. Okay, so if you were looking at a sign, you wouldn't be able to read it. So uh, just be aware of that. And um, the reason for that is you don't have a prism. You're looking into, a, you know, into the waist level finder. There's no prism to correct the image. Although some cameras, not the Ashika, did take prisms. On most leaf shutters that are in twin lens reflex cameras, the top speed is a 500th of a second. So if you need faster speeds for action, you're not going to get it with a twin lens reflex, although a twin lens reflex probably isn't your best bet to photograph action. Okay, so that's the advantages and the disadvantages of a twin lens reflex. Now let's specifically talk about this particular camera. The Ashika 12 was introduced in 1967. It was only in production for about a year when they came out with the Ashika 124, which took both 120 and 220 film. This camera has an 80 millimeter 3.5 taking lens and an 80 millimeter 2.8 viewing lens. It's f the taking lens is four elements in three groups. It's of the Tesser design. It has a Copal SV leaf shutter, as I said, it sinks at all speeds up to 1 500th of a second. It takes Bay 1 filters. There are Bay 1, Bay 2, and Bay 3 filters for different size lenses. The Yashikas all took Bay 1 filters. They bayonet right into the front of the lens. There's also an external bayonet uh, for a lens hood. There's also lens hoods that 
attached to the inner bayonet. So let's go over the camera now, starting on the right side. We have our advanced crank, which also cocks the shutter. We just turn it till it stops. It's not even a complete turn. Then we come all the way back. That cocks the shutter. Okay, it has a rest position here. We have a frame counter here. Tells us what frame we are on. Attachment for the neck strap. Actually, I have a, neck, a Nikon neck strap on this camera right now. All right, that's it for the right side. Let's come over to the front. There's a bit more on the front. We have our shutter release at the bottom here. It is threaded for a standard cable release. It has a locking collar here. We just turn it around. There's a red arrow on it. We line up the red arrow with the red L on the camera and our shutter release is locked. That's a nice little feature to have. Okay, we come up a little bit here and we have a wheel to set our shutter speeds. Again, they're from one to one five hundredth of a second. We also have a B setting for bulb, which when you put, when you press the shutter release, the shutter opens. When you, re, when you let go of the shutter, the shutter closes. That's for time exposures. Okay, that's it for this right side of the front. Now we come to the left side. At the bottom, we have a self timer lever. You just push this to the right, press the shutter release, and it will count down and fire the camera. Above that, we have a sync selector. M is for bulbs. X is for electronic flash. If you're going to be using electronic flash with this camera, make sure this lever is in the down position. In fact, I would suggest stuffing something in here, a little piece of plastic or something, so you can't accidentally move it to M because you will get blank images. Above that, we have our PC socket to plug in your flash. And also over here on this side, opposite the shutter speed selector, we have our aperture selector. Just turn this, it could be set anywhere in between. Of course, it goes from 3.5, which is the maximum aperture, up to 32, the minimum aperture for this lens. All right, let's, uh, let's go to the top of the camera now. You'll notice a um, window here. This is for the built-in meter. It, um, it's not working. It uh, uses a CDS cell and a PX625 battery. Uh, they were mercury batteries back in the day. I was told you can use an alkaline battery in it, but this meter doesn't work. And uh, on the above the camera, as you look down on the top right here, we have a, the meter needle. And as you adjust your shutter speed or aperture, they would line up and you would have correct exposure. To the right of that, and I forgot to mention this when I was talking about the right side of the camera, is your selector for ISO. Okay, now let's go to the left side of the camera. We have our cold shoe. I'm going to mount an accessory here. Below that, we have our focus knob. And when you focus a twin lens reflex camera, hopefully you could see this, the entire front moves back and forth to focus. So it's focusing, obviously, both lenses at the same time. It is marked in both meters and feet. And you can focus down to about 3.3 feet, of course, to infinity. Also, here is a depth of field guide. All right. All right. At the bottom here is where your battery would go. Again, this meter doesn't work, so I'm not going to worry about that. All right. Now, there's two knobs here, and I'll get to them when we talk about loading the camera. All right. So let's talk about the viewfinder about the waist level viewfinder. Okay, flip it up and it has four sides. You can look down and focus your image, compose your image. It also has a flip up magnifier. By pressing in on the front of the waist level finder, a magnifier will flip up for fine focusing. Also, after the magnifier flips up, if you would like, you press down on the front of the finder and you have a sport finder, a non-optical sport finder. So that would work if you're, you pre-focus your camera and rather than using the waist level finder, you can just view, view through 
the sport finder. It's obviously not as accurate as the screen as far as your composition, but if you need to take some shots quickly of something happening, it is a way to go. You could also use it for landscapes, I guess, if you're not on a tripod and you want to just hold the camera at a higher angle than you could by holding it at waist level, you can use that after focusing. Okay, we'll flip that back. All right, I'm gonna show you how to load the camera. To open the back of the camera, there's a little wheel here, you turn it, okay? And the bottom and the back of the camera flip up. There's a disadvantage to that in that if this camera was mounted on a tripod, well, how do you change film? You have to take it off the tripod. By the way, there is a tripod socket on the bottom of the camera. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to load a roll of film. I have a roll of HP5, which is a 400 speed film. Okay, flip this open. And what we need to do is remove, well, first let's open the back. Okay, we're going to turn this knob at the bottom. To the O, it's marked closed and O. You can see that. Back flips open. We're going to take our roll of film. First, I had already pulled this knob out, but this knob would normally be in. Okay, we're going to pull this knob out and turn it a little. We'll keep it in the out position. That will enable us to drop the film in here. When this is when the film is in, that goes in and engages the spool of the film. So we're just going to turn that, all right? Now, we're going to remove this paper. That keeps the roll from unrolling. Okay, we're going to open it up, and there's a tapered end here. Okay, so we're now going to take the film and stick it in the bottom of the camera, in the bottom part, and drop it in, and then push this knob back in. Okay, make sure it engages the film. Now we're going to pull the film up, okay, across the film plane. We're going to take this tapered end and place it into one of the slots in the take-up spool. Okay. Always make sure this is in straight and that the take-up spool is in straight. All right, and you see we have one of the slots available. We're now going to take this and we're going to push it in. Then we're going to hold a finger on the film as we had turned the the crank, and it starts to go onto the take-up spool. Now, there are two little red dots here, two little red arrows, one here and one here. We're going to slowly advance the film, and we're watching for an arrow, a big arrow on the film. Okay, when that arrow lines up with these two dots, we close the back. I'm going to close the back. I'm going to turn this to the lock position. We are now going to crank the advanced crank. Keep going until it stops. And hopefully you can see this. One is now in the frame counter window. And the film is loaded and we're ready to take our first picture. When the film is done, what will happen? After you've taken your 12th picture, this crank will turn freely. Just keep turning it. You'll feel less resistance at the end when that back end of the paper comes off the spool at the bottom. And we wind it up, open the back, take the film out, and they'll be a little similar to this piece of paper that was taped onto the, at the beginning of the roll. There'll be a similar one at the end. We then just need to moisten it with our tongue and seal it, seal it up and send it off for processing or take it into your darkroom and process it yourself. So that's about it for this camera. Um, 
It's got a pretty sharp lens. Pretty impressed with it. This one is in really nice shape other than the meter. You can find these. I think I paid $85 for this about five years ago at a thrift shop, but I've seen them all over the place as, as with most used pieces of equipment. Um, 100, 150, 200, the prices are all over the place. The latest model of the Yashica TLR was the Yashica Mat 124G. That had the meter, took a 120 and 220 film. There's a lot of plastic in that camera. Those cameras sell for a lot of money today. 350, maybe even $400. Personally, I don't think they're worth it. I think if you can find a Yashica 12 or a 124, I think you're, you're getting a, a better deal because you're not paying nearly as much. And these are all metal construction. The meters may not work, but the meter may not work on the 124G as well. And it's best to use a handheld meter anyway. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you now know something. If you didn't before, you know a little something about a twin lens reflex. Um, that large negative is a joy to work with. If you're still, if you still have a traditional dark room and you're making prints, it's just great to print from such a large negative. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below or send me an email. I respond to all questions or I try to respond to all questions. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I usually come out with a new video every Monday and Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So I will talk to you next time.